Last week I showed you how to add unit tests to existing code. What I'm going to do this week is to refactor that original code. And this is actually quite interesting because it's going to show you what happens to unit tests if you improve the design of the original code, especially if you're creating a new piece of software. There's a lot of things to think about. I've written a free guide to help you. This is available at iamcodes.com slash design guide. This contains the seven steps that I take whenever I design a new piece of software. And by writing it down, I hope this also helps you avoid some of the mistakes that I made in the past. So iamcodes.com slash design guide, and the link is also in the description of this video. Now, let's go back to those unit tests. So I've written now most of those tests. You see that all the files that I'm testing or the payment process, they all have coverage of 100%, which is great. But as you see, there is a part of the code that's really hard to test, in particular the processor and the function for actually paying an order. So what I'm going to do now is approach this a bit differently and actually refactor the code to make these tests a lot easier. In particular, I'm going to make these tests for the payment and the processor a lot simpler. You may not always be able to do these kinds of refactoring, so sometimes you just have to mock stuff because you can't change the original code. But if you can, this is a good way to see how refactoring code is also going to simplify your test a lot. There's a couple of things you can do here. The problem is that test pay order creates a payment processor itself, which is not really what we want. So what you can do is change pay order to use dependency injection. That means we provide it with the objects that it needs. And then testing it becomes way easier because if we can provide it with the payment processor, we have control over how the payment processor is created. And it gives us much more flexibility. Later on, if you combine it with dependency inversion, that's even better because then you can replace it by another payment processor without having to change anything in the pay order function. Let's change the pay order function to not create a payment processor itself anymore, but rely on dependency injection. So we're going to introduce an extra parameter here. So let's call that the processor and that's the payment processor instance. So this we're not going to do here and this is going to be processor.charge. So now we have our pay order function that has process.charge. Now, of course, if I run the test, I'm going to get an issue because, well, pay order doesn't work anymore. So my test have failed. So now I have to refactor the code so that the test actually work again. So in test pay order, instead of doing all these mocks here, I can create my own payment processor. And in order to do that, let's change one more thing in pay order and make this a bit more generic. So I'm not going to import the payment processor, but I'm going to define a payment processor protocol so that I can easily introduce a mock version of the payment processor so that I can test pay order a bit more easily. So I'm going to create a class called payment processor. I just give it the same name. It doesn't really matter. And that's going to be a protocol. So I won't have to change the payment processor itself because there is no inheritance relationship here. This uses doc typing. So payment processor, and the only thing that it has is a charge method, which has a self. It has a, a card, which is a string. It has a month, which is an int, and a year, which is also an int, and we have an amount, which is an int. And this will return none. And let's add some doc string here. Charges the card with the amount. There we go. So that's pay order. This doesn't change anything in the rest of the code. It just means that pay order doesn't rely directly on the actual payment processor that's defined here anymore, which is good. Because now what we can do in test payment is create our own little mock class here. Class payment processor mock. And the only thing that this is gonna have is also a charge method, which looks exactly like this. So let me just copy this over. That's probably easier paste it here and then let's add a print here with charging a card with amount amount like so and what i'm doing here by the way this is a formatting trick this turns an integer i need to divide it by 100 by the way because amount is in cents but this is going to add two decimals when i print this so that's really useful so that's the simple print here that the mock does. So what I can do now is delete these things because that's no longer needed. And I also don't need to do this anymore, but I can simply provide to pay order a new payment processor mock object, which 
doesn't need any API keys, so that's great. We don't need to initialize anything, that's perfect. And we can do the same thing here. So here I'm also going to remove this, it's no longer needed, and we're going to introduce our payment processor mock object. If you scroll up, then we can actually remove this dependency here because we don't rely on the actual payment processor anymore. We just want to test the pay order method. So let's see what this does. So now I'm going back to my Python console and I'm going to run the test again. And now we see, yes, the test passed again. And the nice thing is test payment has now become a lot simpler because, well, we just create a very simple class here. Uh, we don't have to do any weird uh, mocking except for the inputs that will attack in a minute. But mocking payment processor is now much simpler. So I really like that a lot. And I can replace the payment processor by another payment processor as well. So at the same time, we have actually really improved the design of the pay order function by just making the code easier to test. So I think that's really important point to take from this. If you write your unit test and you focus on making your code easier to test, that's generally going to improve the design, which is great. Now, Another issue with pay order is that it asks for input. And that's annoying because now we have to mock the input. It's actually also not a good idea to do this because pay order, well, that's generally something that we might want to use in a lot of different systems. So maybe we want to also use it in an app where we don't have a keyboard input, at least not a classic keyboard input from the console. So what you probably want to do is instead of putting all these inputs here is group those things and put them in one place. And the best place for that would be the main function. So we would read the card information here. So that's where we have all our inputs. Then we provide that information to pay order and then pay order uses it to actually process the payment. And then we can test it more easily because then in a test we can simply provide mock fake values instead of having to mock the input. Now we need to do another refactoring because we need a way to provide that information to pay order. Now what we could do is simply have card, month and year and add it to pay order, but then it would start getting a lot of arguments here, which is not so great. So instead I'm going to create a credit card class. I do need to write it correctly, obviously. And then we're going to create a very simple data class that contains the credit card information. That's a credit card. What do we have? We have a number, which is a string. We have an expiry month, which is an int. And we have an expiry year, which is also an int. So that's our credit card class. And now we can move these inputs that we have here to the main function. So I'll just put that right here. There we go. We're not yet doing anything with them. I'll change that in a minute. So now what we can do in pay order is add a credit card here. Like so. And let's also import that. And then we're going to delete these card month year. And now we have process.charge and we have the card number, the month and the year that we can supply here. So we can even make this a bit better by also letting payment processor rely on a credit card. So let me just um, delete this. And what we're going to do is we want to provide the card here, which is also a credit card, like so. And then this is going to be card.number and card.month and card.year. And actually we can make validate card also take a credit card instead of these three values, like so. And now here we just provide the card. That's even simpler. And then here we have, of course, to fill in the checksum for card.number. And here we provide card.expiry year and card.expiry month, like so. And now this is also a lot simpler and in payment we can simply supply the card. So uh, I just delete this and provide the card here. Let's run the test to see if uh, this breaks anything. So now we get a bunch of problems like in test payment. So in test pay order we now of course need to provide a credit card instead of doing all this monkey patching stuff that we have here. But that's actually really easy now. One thing you can do is simply define a credit card object here in your test method and then 
provide that to pay order. PyTest also has something called fixtures because we're going to be using the credit card objects in several tests. I'm also going to need it here and here and in test processor, I'm also going to need a credit card because I'm also charging a card here. So in unit testing, fixtures allow you to provide standard objects that you're going to need in several of your tests. So you define them in one place and then you can use them in several tests. So here's an example of what a fixture in PyTest looks like. So you can use this decorator to define a fixture. You define a function. In this case, we call it card that returns a credit card and then we get, we create the object here with the credit card number, the month and the year. And now what you can do instead of, let's say test pay order, I don't need monkey patch anymore. I can simply supply the card and that's of type credit card. And now what I can do is I don't need this. I don't need this. And now I can simply supply the card to pay order like so. And I can do the same thing for the other tests. So pay order invalid. No more monkey patch. I have my card, which is a credit card. And let me delete this. And we simply supply the card here, like so. And you can do the same thing, by the way, for the processor mock. So you can also create a fixture that has a function that returns a payment processor mock and then use that in the various places in your test. It's up to you what you find more convenient. Here, in this case, this is just a very simple uh, line of code, so I don't feel the need to uh, use a fixture here, but if it becomes more complicated, I can imagine that you'd want to use a fixture for this as well. So we have this, and in test processor, we can now start doing the same thing. So we can also supply a mock credit card and supply that to the charge method when we call that here. One more thing is that you may have noticed that I have chosen a date here, December 2024, which is great because at the moment it's not December 2024, but this means that as soon as we reach this date, suddenly our unit test is going to fail. So if you want to program for the long term, then it's not such a good idea to put hard-coded dates like this in your test. So instead of doing this, what you should probably do is always make sure that this is a date in the future because that's actually what you want to test. The date is valid as long as it's in the future, right? So for that, we're going to need uh, the date object from date time so that we can construct a date in the future. So what we can do instead is we just take today and then the year of today and we add two just to be sure. And then we replace this by the year. And because I'm using a fixture now, this is changed in all of the tests that are using it. So that's really nice. Now for processor, you can do exactly the same thing. I'm not going to show it in the video because I think you can figure it out yourself. But there are a few minor things that I do want to show you. One is that in the payment processor, Loon checksum actually doesn't need to be a method of payment processor at all. It can simply be a function. And that's also going to simplify things. So if I take this code and I remove the self here, so now it's just a simple function that also simplifies our test. Because now in the processor, I have these tests where I need to create a payment process. Well, that's actually not needed anymore. So I can delete this line and I can just use the function directly. Of course, I do need to import it in this case, but now this is actually much simpler. I simply call the function. I don't need to define a payment processor and I can just do a couple of these checks. So that's much easier. And of course here you also want to do the same things with the dates to make sure that your unit tests don't break in a couple of years because that's definitely not what we want. But what you can do now is also define a fixture for the credit card and do it exactly in the same way as we did for the test payment. I'll put the final version of this code in GitHub so you can take a look at the end result. So final thing that I think we should take care of is the API key which is now hard coded here. And I don't think that's a good idea. Normally what you would do is that this kind of sensitive data is not defined in the code itself, but somewhere else. Uh, generally that's going to be an environment variable. And then you can use uh, .env to put it in a .env file. Make sure you don't commit that file to your repository, but that contains the sensitive data. You can give that to the developers that need access and then it's separate from your code and it doesn't end up accidentally in a public place where you don't want your API key to be found, obviously. So instead of putting it here, let's put it in a .env file. So I will create a .env file right here and then I'm going to write API key equals 
And now let's copy this. There we go. And we're gonna put it right here. That's our API key in the .n file. Then I'll delete it here. There's a package called python.env that can read these files and provide them as environment variables directly, which is really useful. So let me install that. There we go. So now in our process test, we can import it. So VS Code doesn't recognize it yet because I just installed it and apparently it needs to, I don't know, refresh something. But this is how you import load.env. And then we simply call the function. So that's going to look for .env file and load the values as environment variables in the OS. And then let's also import OS so we can read environment variables. And then we can define the API key as follows. So as I said, I'll put the final version of this code in GitHub so you can take a look. A final thing for you to think about when you're writing your unit tests, which is that you have to make sure that you're testing the right thing at the right place. For example, here at the test payment file, I'm testing the pay order function. So I'm testing that what happens if I create an order with a line item or without a line item. So there I'm specifically testing that this if statement here is actually working as it should. What I'm not doing is checking that the charge works for valid and invalid cards because then I'm actually testing the processor and not the pay order function. So you always have to make sure that you're testing the right thing in the right place. So in test payments, I'm testing the things that are inside pay order. In test processor, well, there I'm testing things like is the card valid? Is the uh, API key valid? Is the date valid? What happens if we have an invalid number, etc., etc. So always be careful about what you test where. So now finally, after doing a bit more cleanup and finalizing the test, I can run PyTest again on the refactored code and we get all tests passed. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it gave you some insight into how unit tests work and how they allow you to refactor your code to improve the design and make your code easier to test at the same time. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. Consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design and development. Thanks for watching, take care and see you soon.